Hey, Vinyl community and uh, other viewers from around the world. It's Mazzy here, and I'm gonna do a little showcase on Dark Horse Records, George Harrison's label. He started in 1974. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about it as we go on because it's been resurrected. Uh, Danny Harrison, Olivia, uh, George's wife, have resurrected the label somewhat of reissues of things that were on Dark Horse as well as possibly some George material and uh, some other artists. So, in celebration of that, I'm just gonna go a little overview of, of Dark Horse Records. There was a time in the late 60s, mostly early 70s, where major labels basically kissed the ass, <laughs> asses of their artists by granting them the rights to have sort of a, their own imprint. I mean, the Beatles were one of the, one of the first, back with uh, EMI uh, and then Capitol with Apple Records. Apple was just, you know, we all know the story out of the lawsuits and the fighting and how basically Apple just dissolved into just a, a mess, a friggin' mess. Well, uh, once that they kind of got out of that, George Harrison wanted to do it all over again. And in 1974, he started Dark Horse Records and negotiated a deal with a very uh, artist-friendly label, A&M Records, uh, Moss and Albert, Albert being Herb Albert, and uh, you know, a and Records, good label, L.A. based, and uh, George Harrison uh, signed up. He shows up at the airport, drives to, uh, uh, I guess, it's to Hollywood to uh, meet with them, and he's met by this young, beautiful woman, Olivia Arias, who eventually became George's wife. What a beautiful photograph, and talk about a loving shot, and... Um, it was all love and blissful splendor for the most part, I guess. Um, this is from the book, Living in the Material World. I'm not gonna get into the whole George Harrison catalog. Although I will put a link below because I did a George Harrison uh, feature of his catalog. And so a link, you can see more of his stuff that talks about it. But this is primary, primarily Dark Horse Records. When it started in 74, uh, I was working uh, in record stores and retail record stores. And from the uh, one of the reps, I got this wonderful lapel pin of the seven-headed horse. In fact, maybe I should show you this first. Beautiful logo. Go to the window. Go to the window. Anyway, lapel pin for Dark Horse. And... Um. Okay, so George Harrison decided he wanted to uh, sign his own artist again and be in kind of an A&R man for the label. Uh, they did kind of have uh, offices in uh, LA at A&M's uh, studio, the famous A&M record studio that used to be uh, the studios of Charlie Chaplin way back in early days of Hollywood. That's where A&M Records uh, was in, the, in their, th all throughout their heyday. Their first signing was in label uh, record put out was this. This is the first Dark Horse release. I have all 11 non-George Harrison records that uh, Dark Horse ever released. So that's what this video is primarily going to be about, showcasing those 11 records. Splinter was a vocal duo, a um, little Badfinger-esque, a little Beatle-esque, and uh, Mal Evans, the Beatles' confidant and uh, helper, and Rhodey kind of turned uh, George on to Splinter, English group put this album out. Now anytime George Harrison um, had involvement or played on these records, he had to use a synonym. So a lot of times during this time, he was using Harry Georgeson. <laughs> Big secret. George Harrison's not on this album because his records were coming out still on uh, Capitol Records. So these, um, he was involved in a lot of this stuff. This is recorded for Frere Park, George Harrison's studio and his estate. Uh, in um, Henley on Thames, just about, what, an hour outside of London, as seen in the infamous Beatles England travel guide to Beatles sites in England. 
Splinter, first album. It's actually kind of did okay. It wasn't a huge hit, but it got some airplay and got some modest sales. Klaus Foreman's on it, Gary Wright's on it, uh, Alvin Lee, Jim Keltner, Klaus Foreman, Billy Preston, you know, the usual people, plus others. Splinter. Of course, Ravi Shankar uh, was part of the family and friends of George Harrison. So this, I have a lot of promos of some of these records because I was on the promo list of the label through A&M at the time. So this is my promo copy and this is like another, this one, uh, this is another copy I got for whatever reason. Um, produced by George Harrison, as you can see right there. Those of you who follow me uh, a lot, you know I love Indian music. I'm a big Ravi Shankar fan. I've seen him at least five times, including opening up for two of the George Harrison 1974 shows. And uh, I saw him like around 1970 uh, in San Francisco, I believe, in Masonic Auditorium on his own with his uh, people. His people uh, saw him at the concert for George at the Royal Albert Hall. Uh, seen him several times over the years. Um, can you imagine a and Records? You know, they probably wanted George and signed signed a, up Dark Horse as a label, and probably to their dismay, which they knew up front, but they did not get George Harrison on a label. He was still with Capitol, and they were probably, I bet you, incubating, hoping they would get George. Because remember, George had done all things in his past, the Contra for Bangladesh, uh, he did uh, Living in the Material World, which are actually all pretty good sellers. So he was on the roll until you see later uh, the album. When this was starting out, he put out Dark Horse and did that uh, infamous uh, tour of his own. But this is a really a wonderful record. This is the insert that came with it. Then there was a band, um, Jiva. Jiva is a Sanskrit from a word to breathe. The labels were really, I think they had one of the best custom labels. What a great label. This record did nothing. In fact, Dark Horse was a pretty much a fail label. Vanity labels many times are fail labels. One of George's favorite bands, and it's kind of interesting, uh, or a personal favorite his, that it was signed. It had really had nothing to do with the, there was no real sound of the label. You take something like Hannibal Records, uh, Joe Boy's label has sort of an English folk feel to it, Brit folk. Some labels do have a feel or a sound. Dark Horse was all over the place. Anyway, the Stair Steps, Chicago R&B band. They had been uh, known uh, in the 70s, late 60s or 70s, as the Five Stair Steps. Uh, this is an album that uh, Billy Preston produced. From Us to You, I don't know how much of a, a hit single that was, but the hype Sticker says it's a hit single. I gotta play these records again because it's been years since I've played them. But I have listened to them, but it's been a long time. Maybe Maslow, you should listen to them, do some research before you show the fucking videos. Anyway, uh, next release, again, these are in uh, release order, or at least catalog order, so I'm assuming they were released in order. But you know how sometimes an uh, album by a label will get, be given a, a number and it'll be held back or held for some reason. I have no information that any of these were not in this order. But Henry McCullough, uh, those of you who know the Beatles and know, uh, you know, he played obviously also with um, Joe Cocker and he played uh, the great guitar solo. It was an early incarnation of Wings with Paul McCartney and he was uh, on um, Wildlife and uh, uh, Red Rose Speedway. And he plays that wonderful guitar solo on Red Rose Speedway on My Love. My Love is, is a song to me. It's one of Paul's sappiest songs, but it's a beautiful song. I think it's about two minutes too long, except that is one of the great killer guitar solos in My Love. 
So whatever you say about the sappy song, and maybe a lot of you love it. Um, anyway, and again, I'm doing this video, as you know, I don't just do Beatle videos, and you could dive in. There's so many other uh, people doing some great, great uh, videos on the Beatles that really dive in every day of Beatle news and talking about now today's announcement about Get Back, the uh, uh, Peter Jackson Let It Be thing. Search her on the web, search those videos, let them do it. Some people have mentioned uh, Dark Horse Records since they got signed uh, to BMG for these other releases, but um, I just wanted to showcase my collection because I don't think any of the other ones have shown the, the actual uh, releases that Dark Horse put out in the 70s. They then they did another Splinter album. Again, uh, Harry Georgeson plays on it, Jim Keltner, Bill Dickinson, John Taylor, and Harry Georgeson, uh, the usual suspects. Again, recorded at Frere Park. Uh, this album is from 1975. The great, uh, oh, Tom Scott's on it and great uh, guitar player Chris Spedding is all over it as well. Then Ravi's back again. Again, I think, I personally think the best records on Dark Horse aside from the George Harrison ones, or even, even including the George Harrison ones, are all the Indian records and the Ravi Shankar records. Uh, this is what's playing now in the background, Ravi Shankar Music Festival from India. It is not a live album, but it's um, just all these great, great Indian musicians, and it's produced by George Harrison. Obviously, he can have his name as a producer, just not as a recording artist, which seems so strange in those days. Every once in a while, you'd have someone, you know, George Harrison, the permission of Apple Records or Capitol Records or EMI Records. But a, this is great, Indian vocalist, uh, Indian sitar music, tabla, sarad. Um, again, I just think this music is, is truly, truly beautiful. Attitudes, again, another promo copy. Attitudes is a rock and roll band. Not really interesting, their interest is who they are. It's almost like a studio musicians super group in a way of the 70s. You know, there's a lot of players that are around in the 70s. Um, in this case, it's the drums, Jim Keltner, actually in a band, not just a musician. Paul Stellworth, Danny Cooch um, on guitar. Cooch was the guy that was a friend of uh, early on of uh, uh, James Taylor, played in The Flying Machine, I believe, with James Taylor, and worked on uh, a lot of the James Taylor albums. There's a whole like, incestuous feeling of Peter Asher and Cooch and James Taylor and the Beatles with Apple and everything. And of course, David Foster, David Foster on keyboards, who became a, a you know, pretty, actually a very big Hollywood composer, producer, arranger, a little slick for my taste, uh, my personal taste, but an amazing uh, producer. He's done some wonderful work in production too. Um, recorded in LA and uh, Sausalito, California, which must have been the record plant. It was that great record plant where um, Fleetwood Mac snorted all that cocaine for rumors. I think they had um, 47 tons of cocaine in a dumpster outside of the record plant in Sausalito when Fleetwood Mac recorded rumors. I don't need to keep showing these labels, the same label, just different track lists, but Attitudes, interesting record. And then another Attitudes record with all same four studio musicians. So you got Paul Stallworth and uh, Cooch, Danny Kochmar, Kochmar, Danny Cooch guitar, and you got uh, Jim Keltner and David Foster. Obviously, Jim Keltner on drums and David Foster on keyboards. I'm going to play this again, too. Um, Ringo plays on it. Uh, Booker T. Jones is on it. Tower of Power horn section. Of course, David uh, Foster arranged it. Tower of Power is on several cuts. Vince Charles Timbalas. Waddy Wachtel, uh, the great Waddy Wachtel, who, I mean, played with 
you know, everybody from Linda Ronstadt to Warren Zevon, one of the, uh, you know, Jackson Brown, one of the great uh, LA session players and toured with a lot of those bands. Just an amazing sound he got. Then we got the, uh, we got Kenny Burke, uh, who was with uh, his brothers, a couple of his brothers in the Five Stair Steps. The, uh, the Stair Steps, R&B from Chicago, rhythm and blues artist, became a solo artist here. Again, an LA produced record. Dark Horse Records. And the final release on, oh, by the way, the last three, starting with that second Attitudes record, uh, this is an important part of the story. A&M imploded with Dark Horse, or Dark Horse imploded with A&M. So when George Harrison signed uh, as a solo artist, he went over to Warner Brothers in 1976. And uh, I showed you, you'll, you'll see this in a moment again, but um, Bugs Bunny riding the Dark Horse. A&M sued George Harrison because yeah, they were really hoping for his catalog, even though his record sales by this point were going down. And um, starting with uh, this record, this was the first Dark Horse record, I believe, released uh, on Warner Brothers, at, oh, distributed by Warner Brothers. So George Harrison signs with Warner Brothers. And takes Dark Horse with them. Big lawsuit happens again, a and sues. They finally, there was a settlement, and um, that Attitudes Records was the first of only three albums, I believe, that uh, Dark Horse put out that were non-George Harrison records. The final one was number 11th non-George Harrison record on Dark Horse was Splinter, yet again. And this album, uh, this is produced by Norbert Putnam, uh, very uh, Nash was a whole the Nashville sound, and um, executive producers George Harrison and Dennis Morgan, Bill Elliott, Don Purvis, George Harrison, Steve Gibson, Norbert Putton, Kenny Buttry, Rod Argent, Rod Argent, David Briggs, uh, sort of the Nashville people or the uh, South people, but recorded again at Fur Park. I guess these guys didn't want to leave England, but they brought all those people. Uh, I gotta listen to this again because I love Norbert Putnam and that whole sound. Um, there's a whole thing that, um, this is 1977, so this is the end of Dark Horse. And Dark Horse started really to disintegrate. George Harrison would keep uh, Dark Horse as a logo pretty much on and off to the end uh, in his career. Uh, but it wasn't, things weren't really marketed as Dark Horse. But um, I think it's an important label and it's interesting to see what they're gonna put out um, probably merchandising as well as uh, labels and hopefully George's stuff as well. So, I'm only showing this record, this was on Capitol. Um, it was not on Dark Horse Records, Capitol Records, but the album's called Dark Horse. When he announced, uh, Dark Horse label for a and Records. He actually released an album of his own called Dark Horse on uh, on Capitol. And this record actually did surprisingly well because it was tied in with his 1974 ill-fated tour. His voice was gone again. I saw two of the shows. He should have canceled the, uh, the tour. He got sick. His voice was messed up. You've heard tapes, those of you who are Beatle fans. Uh, and he recorded this song, this album, when he had that horrible voice. So, um, don't know why he did that, but he should have postponed it. And uh, you know, Danny Harrison with the announcement that uh, Dark Horse has been signed up with uh, BMG Music and the label is resurrected. They're gonna reissue some of the catalog, which is a little strange. They're gonna bring on some other artists that they are symbiotic with, including uh, some catalog albums by uh, Joe Strummer and the Mescaleros as well as Ravi Shankar, family and friends. Some have already come out on uh, downloads. Uh, they're working on uh, even Harrison's. Hopefully there'll be a 50th anniversary of All Things Must Pass this year, next year and possibly a Bangladesh, um, and possibly eventually footage, apparently there's amazing footage of this tour. You know, drug-infused problems. Again, there are some good songs. Dark Horse was a, uh, somewhat of a hit, and then Ding Dong, uh, Ding Dong Ding Dong became somewhat of a 
annual New Year's Eve uh, holiday hit. So, great songs on here. Unfortunately, if, if George could have gone in and overdubbed his voice when it was normal, it would have been much better. So, um, this again was on Capitol Records, not part of Dark Horse, but call Dark Horse. So, I can totally sympathize in a weird way with a and Records with this whole thing. But finally, in 1976, George did go to Warner Brothers, as I said, and put out this record. And um, this was did pretty well. This is a UK copy I got. I have an original American, and this is an original UK. Um, has the hits um, "Crack a Box Palace," "Beautiful Girl," the song "True Love," which which is a which is a um, a standard, an old standard, and. Um, This song, this song was a pretty big hit and it had an accompanying video with uh, some of Monty Python, Eric Idle on Monty Python on it. And it was sort of a reaction to the lawsuit of him getting sued for My Sweet Lord and He's So Fine, the song. But um, these are kind of cool. Look just like George. These are Warner Brothers promotional 33 and a third sunglasses. Kind of look like Joe Biden, don't they? <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, I feel like um, cosmic vinyl here. If you don't know what cosmic vinyl is, you need to. Go check him out. Um, George Harrison, 33 and a third. And quickly through the catalog, uh, his albums, uh, mostly these are promo copies that I got from Warner Brothers at the time, my record business time. Uh, this, is a, this is probably one of his best sounding albums. Uh, I'd say it's close to audiophile, so uh, the sound of this in the George Harrison box and just original, it really well recorded. And this has a Not Guilty, which um, was one of the songs that was left off the White Album. In fact, uh, versions of that are on the White Album box. And um, great record, Blow Away. Blow, Blow Away was somewhat of a hit as well. Uh, this is the album that came out right after uh, John Lennon passed away, was killed. And there is a song on here, um, all those years ago that Linda and Paul sing harmonies and Ringo plays on two drums. So it's like the Threedles, the first time uh, any three of the Beatles were on a record uh, post uh, John's death. Baltimore Oriole, great Hoagy Carmichael song is on here. Teardrops, I thought was always a great song. This is actually a pretty good album. It's a painting that hangs in the Tate Gallery, the Tate Modern, I believe. In the Tate Gallery, getting a promo copy. Gone Tropo, didn't get a lot of love. Um, I think it's interesting, I think it works better now. Not a great record, but some great stuff in it. You know, George always had some great uh, bits and pieces, but this is great. Does this remind you of Egypt Station cover a little bit, uh, Paul McCartney's album? But again, these are Warner Brothers. They list Dark Horse, but Dark Horse did way, way into these years. It was pretty much defunct as a ongoing label. And then of course, uh, this is what John, excuse me, George uh, did a tour in 91 with Eric Clapton in Japan only. And that's when we all wish he would have come here. His voice was great, the recordings are great. Uh, there was an album, I think, only originally released in Japan initially. I do have a, a, a press kit from the album when Warner Brothers promoted some things about it. A promo stand up for the album. This was re uh, eventually released uh, when the George Harrison vinyl uh, box was issued several years ago as a standalone. So obviously that is my uh, reissue copy. And uh, I had the CD, but never the vinyl until uh, 2017. But I had a, a release of that. Now, just a couple other little things. Uh, again, um, Brainwash, even though they had not, 
Dark Horse is long gone. They still list as Dark Horse on the back. This is Brainwash. It came out posthumously. Um, this is George Harrison Best of Dark Horse Years. Uh, this is actually a good record because not only didn't sell a lot, but they put a version out uh, of the best of those years. And what's nice about it, it has two extra tracks. It's got um, Cockamamie Business and Poor Little Girl. It opens up a song called Poor Little Girl, which is an amazing, amazing song. So seek this out. You don't see this a lot on vinyl. Um, but seek it out because it's really good. I mean, it has the hits like uh, Got My Mind Set on You, Cloud Nine, Crackerbox Palace, Here Comes the Moon. So it's all the dark horse, uh, pretty much the Warner Brothers years for the most part. But I love it. This is a nice collection. And then, of course, um, his... Probably one of his biggest albums, obviously, um, when he was on Dark Horse. The comeback album, this, and then obviously the Traveling Wilburys. But um, this is a great record. Uh, this is produced by um, Jeff Lynne and George Harrison. Love this record. A few other things just to show you off uh, some things. A CD box of the Dark Horse years. There's also a Companion Capital Years box set of CDs. And this is a wonderful box. This is what's playing now, and I showed you uh, that. This is a Ravi Shankar collaborations. All the things that he collaborated on, on Dark Horse. Mostly Dark Horse, not all. This great record. Chance of India, Ravi Shankar, a really great collaboration. Produced by George Harrison. The Music Festival from India. This is a live at the Royal Albert Hall. And this, again, this is what's playing now. They have these uh, almost like slightly larger than seven inch folders and they have a slip case in where the CD fits in. And it's really nice booklet as well. So that was my serious like view of Dark Horse Records. Um, problematic label that an artist started to get the music out there that he wanted to, you know? It's been a problematic history of artists doing their own labels. There are some very successful ones and probably more failures. <laughs> than that. So, um, Mazzy loves you and uh, go put on some Indian music and meditate. Burn some incense. Saffron. Mazzy loves you. <laughs>